So welcome to the John Muir Land Trust 2020 virtual briefing. I'm Melanie Hogan, the Director of Major Gifts at John Muir Land Trust. In just a minute, we'll get started on the presentation from Linus Uckel, our Executive Director. Thanks, Melanie. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us. We're really thrilled that everybody is able to be here today. And um, I wanted to start with an overview of who we are. Um, many of you are already members and supporters and uh, understand the land trust, but just so that everybody does come up to speed on that, we're a local non-governmental 501c3, so we're a nonprofit public benefit organization uh, based in uh, Contra Costa and Alameda County and incorporated in the state of California. Our mission is to protect and care for open space, ranches, farms, parkland, and shoreline in the East Bay. Uh, for which we're, uh, we're well-known in, uh, again, Contra Costa and Alameda County. Our vision as to how we undertake that and why is to ensure the beauty, the diversity, and fullness of our natural areas and that they continue to enrich, enrich and sustain all generations, all generations of life. So it's not just for us. It is a legacy of those folks that have done things for us previously and then handed it on to us and for us to do that for future generations. So what we do, we work with private landowners and specifically willing sellers um, as private landowners and uh, individual contributors, private foundations, corporate partners, all the nonprofit partnerships and public agencies that help us together as an entire regional community uh, accomplish our goal, which is to preserve land, encourage environmental awareness, and permanently protect those places that make these space special. So all of those uh, properties, once they're protected under our umbrella, uh, that protection runs with the deed forever. So where do we work? We work in the uh, following service area, which you can see on your screen, um, up in the Franklin Ridge area, recently you've seen Almond Ranch preserved, uh, Car Ranch down here, Painted Rock is a recent acquisition. Today we're going to be talking a lot about Pacheco Marsh, a little bit about Family Harvest Farm out here. The distinction here today is that these acquired properties, Fernandez Ranch out here and so forth, we're well known for doing that, where we announce a campaign and then uh, raise the funds to acquire that, that property. Today, we'll also be talking about properties that are not so much about the acquisition, but also about the restoration. So that's uh, going to be very much of interest. And I was really pleased to see some of the feedback on the poll about being uh, interested in habitat, uh, preservation, public recreation, and so forth, all very relevant to um, our project work right now. So for having done all of that work, we've uh, protected a number of lands, and we, uh, as we do so, we put together property icons that you see up on your screen. Uh, these are done by our very talented uh, graphics artist, Megan Mailer. So as we accomplish a project, we always uh, develop a property icon to celebrate that outcome. And today, we're going to be talking most specifically about Pacheco Marsh. And I'm going to pause here because I am having a little bit, I will admit it, technical issues. So I'm going to escape from this and um, try and better accomplish what we're doing here. Hold on one second. Bear with me. I'm going to bring that back up. Pardon me for going, putting you through this. So I want to make sure you get this full full presentation as intended. So I'm back up and I'm going to start again from where we left off. There you go. So this, this should help. Um, sorry about that brief interlude. Um, the technology is uh, virtual. We'd rather be out on these properties, but given the circumstance, we're, we're really pleased to be able to connect with you today this way. So with that said, Pacheco Marsh is really central to our subject today, and we're very excited to share uh, a lot about this uh, project. 
the way we often refer to Pacheco Marsh as, as a place with a scarred past, but with a bright future. And the scarred past really has to do with industrial activity. The property has been diked and drained and partially filled. The creek over time, which is today known as Walnut Creek, had been widened and redirected. There's a sanitary sewer outfall. I mean, it's really been through the chipper. And yet amidst all of that destruction, it's still home today to 10 special status plant and animal species, including the California black rail and so forth. So it's got tremendous potential, but it also needs a lot of work. So let's talk about a little bit more specifically where Pacheco Marsh is. And to do that, I'm going to put you through yet another change here. I'm going to close out on that. I'm going to bring up um, Google Earth so that you can get a nice regional view of what I'm talking about. So previously, we've been speaking about uh, Painted Rock here, Almond Ranch there. Um, Pacheco Marsh is right up in here. You can see it. So regionally, if I were to zoom in on it, you can see its relationship to the I-680 corridor and specifically the Benicia Martinez Bridge. So as you're going across that bridge, if you look off to the right or to the east, you see this mosaic of, of uh, marshland, which is Peyton Marsh. And just to the east of that is a more despoiled, uh, dewatered previous saltwater marsh that is Pacheco Marsh. And let me, let me bring up yet another program and make that a little bit more specific as well. Bear with me here. Um, let's go to specific parcels. So here, even more specifically, as I, as I come down in there on this view, you see the uh, I-680, the Benicia Martinez Bridge, Peyton Marsh here, and as I zoom in, this is Pacheco Marsh, and it's comprised of three parcels. Now that we're doing a larger, uh, a larger restoration, uh, which also involves Lower Walnut Creek, um, which is to the south of this. But today we're going to be talking about these three parcels: Walnut Creek to the east here, Peyton Marsh. Um, there's uh, Point Edith out here, wildlife area. You see, these are essentially functional and healthy tidal marshland, saltwater marsh. This, for having been put through so much over uh, essentially 100 years plus, is in a very different state of, of being. So as I zoom in in that again, two parcels here and here were previously purchased. I want to point out that this was not originally included, but it is today, and I'm going to just call out right from the beginning, that Tesoro here, this industrial complex, which is also Marathon Oil, recently purchased this parcel as well, which is the North Reach. It's about 18 acres for $4 million, and at no cost of the land trust is conveying that property to accomplish the entire project of this restoration and public access uh, Chicken Marsh project. And we're very grateful to them for that very generous donation of land. 18 acres for $4 million, that's expensive. And they really stepped up and did that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so that you can see the difference between this, again, mosaic or prism of essentially healthy saltwater marsh. And then as we come over to Pacheco Marsh, how despoiled and they're watered and ultimately scarred by industrial activity out here. This, this had to do with uh, sand mining and where the sands that were being brought in from the bay were, were offloaded and then used for cement manufacturing and so forth. You'll see this road more or less follows what was a, uh, is a sewage outfall from uh, the central sand and so forth. And again, Walnut Creek over here. We'll get a little bit more into that. But that gives you an idea as to what's out there and the difference between what a essentially healthy saltwater, intertidal saltwater marsh is versus one that's really been despoiled altogether by uh, decades of, of uh, industrial impact and um, other, other things that really despoiled that saltwater marsh. So I'm going to get out of this view. I'm going to go back to our... 
PowerPoint. Bear with me here. So now that we know where Pacheco Marsh is, uh, let's talk a little bit about what happened to Mar Pacheco Marsh. So um, Pacheco Marsh is something that is uh, probably best seen in terms of how to understand what happened through a, a historical lens of, of different views over time. And so looking backwards, I want to start right here and thank Paul Betchens, who may or may not be on the line, but Paul Betchens is a uh, civil engineer with uh, Contra Costa County Flood Control. He's a senior civil engineer, wonderful scientist who has been working on this for many years. Um, he's taught, uh, you know, tall pony Paul Betchens, at least 19 hands high. He has put together all sorts of great science around this, all things Chico Marsh. He's been a guiding light on this project, and uh, just very important. We'd be nowhere without him. And what I'm handing off to you here are, is essentially a, a number of slides that look backward throughout history as to how Pacheco Marsh has been impacted by a lot of the influences that we were just mentioning. So here's an aerial of Pacheco Marsh, and let's, let's really go back in time. This is a lithograph from 1895 of the Diablo Valley, and you can see here it's listed as Pacheco Creek. Back in the mid-1800s, about 1851, Pacheco was actually a really uh, vital shipping center that you can see a number of boats or ships. These are ocean navigable ships going up what is now Walnut Creek. This was a deep channel that would go up and, and essentially um, carry grain from Ignacio and San Ramon and Tassajara Valleys. There were warehouses in, in Pacheco, a flour mill and shops along the creek. And that creek flowed deep and freely out into the Susun Bay. But over time and gradually over many years, for a variety of reasons, whether it was uh, man-made ecological damage or a uh, series of fires and floods, as well as earthquakes, the creek began to silt in, and as it filled the slough with silt, um, Pacheco basically closed down. Folks moved from Pacheco, which was a vital center, to uh, Todos Santos, which is now known as Concord. So you'll see from this 1898 USGS or U.S. Uh, geological survey topographical map, again, if this was Peyton Marsh, as we saw before, and this is Point Edith, that the uh, prism of saltwater marsh was altogether intact back in that day. And again, this was Pacheco Creek or now Walnut Creek coming in. Um, and it was essentially a vital and um, healthy saltwater marsh. Then over time, again, get a little bit of a closer view so you can see the nature of the, the course of those waterways, those inlet, as it were. Over time, now this is a, an aerial from 1939. You see Walnut Creek, what's now Walnut Creek, then Pacheco Creek, beginning to close off with silting to occlude it's much less ability to navigate this stream. The parcel outline in relationship is is much less close to the actual course of the uh, of the creek and then moving forward in time 1959 you see where central sand has built a sewage outfall to the carquina strait uh, walnut creek is still very silted in it's occluded the, the marsh is still there but is beginning to be impacted there's some industry coming in here as well Moving forward in time, we come to a 1982 aerial, and here you see where suddenly the, the stream or Walnut Creek has been channelized. And again, I don't, uh, I grew up in Walnut Creek, uh, and some of you may remember back in the mid 60s uh, or early 60s when downtown Walnut Creek would flood, and it was, it was sort of like Venice Aqualta, except there weren't, weren't the attributes of Venice so much as it was the El Rey Theater and the, and the uh, Greyhound Bus Depot, and everybody was out in waders because water was coming up over the curb and into the buildings. And so uh, Army Corps of Engineers and, and flood control and so forth followed through with uh, channelizing Walnut Creek so that we could sweep away those flood waters to the Cartina Strait. Um, and that was successful in its way in terms of that sort of engineering. But interestingly, over time, 
sediment still deposited even in those very channelized streams. So this is from 2008, an aerial. Again, you can see where sediment has been closing off Walnut Creek again. Um, and the sediment is actually here along the border or on the bank of the stream creating habitat which um, is partly now what we're restoring, but you've got up here all the dredge spoils, the, the um, industry of salt mining or salt, yeah, salt mining and then depositing here, the offloading. Central sand still has that outfall, but also the uh, road surface, uh, the, the heavy uh, industrial trucks and so forth coming and going to move, move that sand. And uh, at this point, you've also seen pipeline coming out from this tank yard and so forth. So there's a lot of industrial activity down here that's impacted uh, the property. So um, moving forward, when this all had happened in 2001, there came an opportunity for uh, John Muir Land Trust, the uh, Contra Costa County Flood Control District, and the East Bay Regional Park District to purchase Pacheco Marsh, or at least those two parcels uh, more to the uh, south of what we were looking at. We came together to do that. Um, the property, property was uh, purchased with the purpose of eventually restoring and permanently protecting the marsh. And then again, I want to point out in 2019, just at the close of this last year, Tesoro Marathon, now Marathon uh, Petroleum, stepped in to purchase and donate that missing North Reach, an incredibly generous uh, gesture on their part. So we are able to completely restore all the way to the shore this, uh, this saltwater marsh. And although it's not yet open, uh, this restoration and public access project that's underway uh, will change all that for the better. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more. So you may ask why... Why restore it? Well, um, let me count the ways. This is such an exciting project. Um, as I said, there's already 10 special status species and there's thriving uh, wildlife out there already. But to recover that vital ecosystem for migrating birds, this will create a world-class birding site uh, for migrating birds, for fish species that spawn in inland streams. Um, this is a vital ecosystem to provide it also just provides essential food and nutrients and refuge for the majority of fish that are in that, that Carquina Strait and into the stream. So it's, it's just vital ecosystem for all of that wildlife. Uh, to renew the habitat is to provide that home to special status plant and animal species, and also to see them thrive again, to become more abundant, and to be able to thrive side by side with human communities as we also provide environmental education and public recre recreation. This is an extraordinary opportunity. We really see this as a unique outdoor classroom with educational features that have the capacity to teach young people about marsh ecosystem functions, for the public to be able to come down and recreate on almost two and a half miles of walking trails. That's trails, not rails. Uh, we won't have any railroad down there. There are going to be trails. Sorry about that. And elevated vistas and bird blinds and, uh, you know, with all the interpretive signs and so forth, it's really um, the promise of this is as good as it gets in terms of public recreation. And it also... Uh, Although it was pulling a little bit lower, and we live in, in, in you know, challenging times in some, some ways, right, and trying to get ahead of the curve, doing and creating this natural solution now actually helps us address some of the things that are inevitably impacting our community. Uh, by creating these natural solutions, we protect shorelines from buffering waves and uh, trapping good sediments in the right place. We, we do protect water quality by filtering runoff and metabolizing those nutrients. Infrastructure. So flood control, this is very much about flood control. And during periods of intense flooding, you can build seawalls and dikes and levees, but they're fragile by comparison to a, a functional saltwater marsh. And so this, this is a, an actually more economical solution as to how to protect community infrastructure, including industry, in, in balance with public access. And importantly, and this is where I was talking about getting ahead of the curve, 
sequestering and storing large quantities of carbon to address global climate change. Climate change is moving more slowly than some of the things that we're dealing with right now, but it's in essence the same thing. How do you, how do you make decisions now to address things that inevitably we, we need to uh, balance against? And uh, saltwater marsh are a fantastic uh, 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 instrument to sequester uh, large quantities of carbon. So this is great outcomes for, uh, for uh, addressing global climate change as well. So what's it going to take? Well, here's a big number. We're asking the public for $1 million in support of the public access and recreation element of the campaign. Um, that's, a, that's a big number. Uh, we know we've got wonderful enthusiasm and support for it, but I want to point out not so much that number as the really good news that already has happened. Even though we're going out for a million dollars for that, that thing that very directly impacts the public, we've already raised $4 million towards that total project cost of $5 million. It's already in the bank. So we're just fundraising to that final gap, and then the uh, entire Lower Walnut Creek and Pacheco Marsh Restoration Project, and again, hats off to Paul Pony Paul Detchens for, for moving this forward as well. Total project cost there is $19.5 million, already raised $14 million. This doesn't count the additional $4 million from Tesoro Marathon uh, towards that acquisition. So combined total is $24.5 we're, we're well on our way to being there already at essentially, what, $18 million plus another four from that acquisition. We're at, we're at $22 million already into this project. So uh, we're very, very hopeful about being able to get this done. And that's why we're coming to you today to help you know a little bit more along with us where we're headed and uh, what it's going to take. And here's one of the outcomes for our being able to um, attain those goals, you'll see um, all of these wonderful attributes. There's uh, elevated vista points for viewing. There's a number of bridges on this public access plan. You'll have a boat launch down here. We expect there'll be a kayak launch here so you don't have to portage too far down the stream. Again, bridging across the channel. Be, if you're in a boat, you'll be able to get out to Point Edith as well, which is essentially the best uh, access by water along the Bay Trail. I mean, and then you can see the restoration and how the intertidal saltwater marshland begins to once again come alive to support that prism of habitat that is so vital to all the, uh, the goals that we were and uh, outcomes that we were describing previously. So how and who are we going to do that with? Well, again, great partner, uh, County Flood Control and Paul. Thanks so much. Our partners at ESA, Placeworks for Design, and JMLT, we've been working hard to better understand what the design would be to convert and restore some of this quality of beautiful habitat out there for this kind of public access. And why, does, why do that? What does that mean? What does public access mean in the tidal wetland restoration area? Well, as we were saying, it, it goes to habitat protection, ecological function, importantly, education. We really have such high hopes for this, as well as that recreation for the public. And finding the right mix of habitat protection and function and education and recreation that works for, for all of that balanced outcome in this kind of setting. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous open space right at shoreline down there. It supports already a wonderful wide variety of special status species, including the California black rail here, um, the uh, Sassoon marsh aster here, Sassoon song sparrow there, and our best friend salt marsh harvest mouse there. Um, and that's just a, a small cross-section of the, of the beautiful species that are out there. And again, this is, this is the kind of quality of experience you have at shoreline in a functional saltwater marsh. And this is what we're very hopeful about. The notion that this would be a destination for school kids from throughout Contra Costa County, um, Alameda County, to visit shoreline and really understand what 
um, what a saltwater marsh ecosystem is about, why it's so vital for them to have that part of their science curriculum, to have a wonderful day at the shore uh, as part of that STEM-related curriculum. This is, this is what produces uh, stewards for the future and uh, appreciation of our beautiful East Bay region. And remember, wherever you live, Everybody owns the bay. That is certainly the polling that we've always seen is that you can live miles inland, but everybody relates to the bay. We all live in the Bay Area. And in that, in that sense, having kids be able to come out, experience environmental education, and really understand the bay and Susun Bay and how, it, how, it's, how the delta is impacting the, the greater bay and so forth. I mean, it's just, it's just a very important aspect of our local culture and certainly toward environmental education. And then there's public recreation, being able to get it out on trail, uh, whether it's uh, dogs on leash or dogs on bike, whatever it might be, sentient creatures being able to recreate in a beautiful, uh, improved recreation area right at shoreline. And uh, when we talk about trails, um, there's a great cross-section of trails that already exist in other restored areas. Ours would obviously be nearby and available for folks in our immediate uh, county. But here's what's uh, been established elsewhere. It gives you a good idea of the kind of access and circulation that you might experience, including for folks with um, uh, some disabilities or those kinds of special needs and need a little extra help. A lot of ADA access out on this property as well. So uh, everybody's welcome. Everybody can be accommodated. Uh, with uh, preferred surface materials and loop trails and all sorts of uh, wonderful accommodations, and including boardwalks and puncheons and bridges. Uh, many of you maybe have seen the Martinez Regional Shoreline Bridge just down the way, beautiful bridge. Uh, boardwalks, puncheons are essentially a, a plank walk and, as opposed to a boardwalk, but you can see the quality of that experience, being able to really get out into the wetland. And once you're there to be able to see the beginnings, we'll take a look at some of this, these sort of vista points and viewing areas to really be at water's edge. And again, we have that, that very north reach, reach parcel now, so you can get all the way to shoreline as a visitor, um, not just to see the saltwater marsh, but to, to see the harbor seals offshore and so forth. So it's going to be, it's going to be a great access outcome. And when you get there, the idea of having some observation points where there's maybe a more meditative experience, uh, time to reflect, time to really take in your surroundings and enjoy the experience of just being at shore and at one with nature and sort of the healing capacity of being out in this restored saltwater marsh as it heals. I think it, I really do believe that it heals us to be doing this kind of work. So we're, uh, we're really very enthusiastic about doing that together to create those kinds of outcomes. And if you're a little bit more exuberant, you can bring your kayak. Uh, we'll have boat launch for you to, to be able to push off into Walnut Creek and explore or out to the mouth of Walnut Creek and along the Bay Trail and out to Point Edith and the like. I mean, this is really exciting access and uh, just a wonderful place to be able to kayak. There's a lot of still water and wonderful wildlife to be able to observe. And then, again, if you're up on dry land and you're part of a, an educational experience, there's all sorts of educational features that we plan to uh, install. And here's some great examples of kiosks and signage. And there's a water elevation marker um, just a, a cross sections of the a cross section of the kinds of elements that you might uh, expect to see, along with uh, um, interpretive elements of what's the story we want to tell, what's the story we want to tell the public, and what's the story we want to tell our children. What's the experience we want them to have when they're down there? You know, some interactive sculpture, some signage that really makes clear what what you're seeing in the area. Um, and then, of course, we always do this poll, and we know we know what you want. You want restrooms. Uh, you know, every survey says we know you want restrooms. Well, you've got it. You're going to have restrooms. Uh, you know, maybe not this in exact dimension and scale and scope, but it'll be out there along with interpretive elements and uh, parking and all of all of the amenities that you might expect for a really wonderful experience uh, down by shoreline at uh, this beautifully restored uh, saltwater marsh. 
and I'm breathlessly coming in for a landing here about uh, Pacheco Marsh. You can hear me talking so fast, but there's so much to talk about here. And I'm just uh, at a high level. Again, folks like uh, Paul Detchens and his crew have done really wonderful science on this project. There's so many levels to it. You know, we'll have plenty to talk about in the future. But this is the overview. This is the high level. I hope you're as enthusiastic about it as I am. And to that end... I'm going to stop for a moment and maybe ask if uh, Melanie wants to jump in and do some polling and some Q&A. Yeah. Thank you for that, Linus. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to – Linus spoke about some surveys that we've already done for Pacheco Marsh, but we wanted to get um, some feedback from all of you. So for the next poll, we want to run um, – we want – to know what public access features are of interest to you. Um, so, let me just stop that chair. Okay, here I'm going to move to the Pacheco Mar Marsh poll and launching the poll. So, take about you know another 10, 15 seconds to mark off all the ones that are of interest to you. <coughs> Great, looks like people are answering. Okay, a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you. So, interestingly, unpaid trails, actually, I think in the earlier um, survey that we did, that was also a very high one. Um, paved trails, of course, toilet facilities, uh, as Linus mentioned. Parking is a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. Maps and guides. And all of this is contemplated in the design, which is good news, and that's interesting. The, and I, I certainly understand the experience of, of being on a, a certain kind of surface that's not paved, which is uh, part and parcel of this in places. And then where we're crossing water, obviously there's boardwalk and punchins and so forth. But where there can be unpaved trails and, and a different kind of surfacing, absolutely. So there's a mix of both in its way, plenty of parking down there, um, bicycle racks and the like. And again, the, the uh, educational information and maps and guides are part and parcel of the education, the environmental education element. And yes, there will be restrooms so, um, and ADA access. So it's a great cross-section and uh, lots of enthusiasm for all of it. So um, thank you for that feedback. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, so now I wanted to um, uh, take some time to uh, answer, or um, yeah, answer some of the questions that have been coming through the Q and A. And uh, we're going to just take a couple right now. Um, Tom asks, "Won't sediment eventually just fill in the marsh naturally?" And I think perhaps what Tom is saying is. Why, why is it necessary to go in and uh, restore it? Um, why don't it just eventually go back to the way that it, it should? Um, there, is, there is in some ways the proposition that if you were to completely knock down all the levees and the dikes and so forth, that eventually nature would find its way to uh, some sort of restoration. But in fact, the property has been so impacted by uh, – by industry and, and construction and upstream uh, channelizing and so forth, that we are, we are called to 
actually undo much of what has been already done by, by the hand of, of humankind to allow nature to take its course. So, so yes, once the marsh is restored, part of that restoration project process is that nature does take its course, but to get there, we have to undo so many of the infrastructure elements that were uh, implemented to uh, really dewater and dike off the marsh as to what it used to be. Without, those, without that undertaking, uh, nothing happens. And in doing that, of course, we're changing the habitat. I, don't, I won't go too far into this, but we're changing the habitat for what is right now terrestrial uh, species moving upstream. Uh, or upland, uh, allowing the marsh to fill in. Um, the other issue that comes to mind with the idea of letting nature take its course, we have a, a rare window of opportunity here. So as we contemplate climate change and sea level rise, the, the marker is probably five feet. That's a, that's a good average as to what might happen. If we don't undertake a saltwater marsh restoration now, Sea level rise forecloses our opportunity to actually do that. It will, we can't sculpt it. We can't allow it to, uh, to become a tidal marsh where it has the, the sort of the prism of, of tidal ebb and flow, but rather just sea level rise foreclosing that kind of dynamic. So it's important that we actually have to become involved with uh, sculpting that, um, undertaking the enterprise and the, uh, the construction that's required to return it to that natural saltwater marsh. Mm -hmm. Long answer, okay. but that's again, it's, it's, it's a rare window of opportunity that we have right now. We have to do it or we lose it. Okay. W one last question. Um, Diane asks, what's the timeline of the project? We had, come very close to having our permitting to undertake construction. And again, I say this with always hats off and gratitude to Paul Detrans and his crew for advancing all of these very complex elements as to being able to get there with the, uh, the permitting of the regulatory agencies and so forth to undertake construction. We thought as early as potentially this spring, that's obviously not uh, possible now, but it will be, we expect, next season and we talk about that as sort of uh, spring to fall uh, well it will undertake it as, as soon as we can probably in the fall and then uh, consecutive to that sort of parallel track to the construction is also uh, the public access project the reason being that it's all been considered as part of our uh, CEQA process which is a requirement of the regulatory agencies the California Environmental Quality Act to really just shine a bright light on how are we going to impact the habitat that's there by undertaking this kind of construction. So we've considered all of that as part of one process. So short answer is about a year, year and a half. Okay. Two years at the most. So we've got to get going. And actually I will say this and I, without dwelling on it, I know we're in challenging times, but uh, the land trust has undertaken restoration before out at Fernandez Ranch during a very significant downturn in 2008 through 2010. Um, that restoration provided jobs, construction, um, wonderful economies of scale for there being so much enthusiasm around it. This is actually a way to advance. It's, the timing, although seemingly awkward, is actually oftentimes very good news in this sort of circumstance because it's an opportunity to go and do that work. We have the funding to pay for it. It, it provides jobs. It provides habitat restoration. It's a way of getting going on things that otherwise might uh, go by the wayside. And um, there's, there's economies to be doing it right now too, because people are, people are going to be enthusiastic about undertaking that work. So um, we, we really want to pull the trigger on this and get it done. Great. Okay, I think that sums it up for this uh, section of the Q&A. Do you want to keep going, Lena? Oh, yeah, there, there's more. So I'm, I'm going to inflect from Pacheco Marsh and uh, move towards some of the properties that have been recently acquired and, and hopefully answer some questions about uh, properties of interest. These are more upland habitat where we've actually, you know, raised the funds to purchase them and 
than to open them versus properties you already purchase, purchased and restoring, like the Checo Marks. This says Upland is Almond Ranch. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, been tracking this, been contributing to it. We're very, very excited about opening it in the fall. Um, our stewardship director and open space ranger, Glenn Lewis, has been out there with uh, members of our stewardship committee working hard and many other volunteers doing work on the property to have it ready for public access. Uh, there are a few open wells, a dilapidated barn, and other hazards that uh, Glenn and crew have been addressing, as well as signage gates and other amenities yet to come. So we're excited about opening Almond in the fall. And just to remind you where it is, um, just in fact, in relationship to Chico Marsh, we were just talking right there. Um, there's Almond, so close by. Uh, in fact, Almond Ranch has a number of headwaters and creeks that contribute to the Alhambra Creek watershed that also flows into uh, Sassoon Bay and the Carquina Strait, uh, the lower delta in essence. So you can see that all of these properties are interconnected by uh, land and water. Um, here's another close-up, and in fact, here you can see that that's Baca Creek, headwaters for Stretzel Creek, named for John Muir's uh, father-in-law, a tributary to Franklin Creek there. All, again, all of them going into the uh, Alhambra Creek watershed on its way to the Cartinas. Um, some beauty shots of the wonderful experience you'll have in the fall. Uh, up on Alden Ranch, that property we call the missing piece, as it connects uh, 18,000 acres of open space that's otherwise fragmented at that point on the ridge line. And so, when with this property acquisition, acquisition we uh, connect the, the we connect the Bay Trail, including and uh, so grateful to our our uh, partners at the Bay Trail and um, just how great they were in, in supporting this acquisition. Uh, uh, Janet McBride, their their senior leader there, uh, just a great, great organization. That 550-mile trail that circumvents the uh, the bay, um, a key piece of that was Almond Ranch to connect to uh, to the John Muir National Historic Site uh, and, and also including the bridge-to-bridge -bridge experience of the Carquina Scenic Loop Trail, uh, Baca Creek Trail out to 6,000-plus acres of Briones, uh, 10,000 acres of the Franklin Ridge. So it connects up, this missing piece that connects up 18,000 acres of open space that's otherwise fragmented, that we can, one can't get to the other without this property having been preserved. It looks like this when you're out there. I'll get that pointer off there. It's kind of an odd glow. Um, just a beautiful experience, beautiful open space. Mount Diablo off the scenic vista in the, in the, to the east there. Um, here is uh, off in the distance Mount Wanda. Um, so obviously this property also connects the public to MPS's John Muir National Historic Site. That was a key element that's part of the connection as well is to expand Muir's homestead and that whole experience. These are the hills that, that Muir sauntered in and including uh, West Hills Farm, which we, uh, which we purchased in 2015. It's also known as Plummer Ranch. It's a, a, a Plummer family is a descendant of John Sweat. Uh, we acquired in 2015. Um, Muir often referred to this area as the West Hills, where he would walk with his daughters, Wanda and Helen. As you can see here, it's the southern swell of the John Muir National Historic Site and Mount Wanda, which we helped preserve and, and hand off to uh, the National Park Service and connects here to Almond Ranch. So this is part and parcel of that same, that same initiative. And uh, we also expect this will open in the fall uh, through a donation from JMLC and as many of you know, an act of Congress to expand that national park will further enhance the John Muir National Historic Site experience, uh, permanently protect Strensel Creek, again, named for Muir's uh, father-in-law, and ex expand that Franklin, Franklin Ridge experience connection to Almond Ranch. And uh, here's a beautiful photo of a, a sort of a modern day walk in the West Hills with a father and his two daughters. And I think that's a Sheltie. 
So um, you can imagine being out there yourself. It's gorgeous country. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful opening in the fall. Um, also wanted to speak a little bit about some mission expansion for JMLT. Again, this is not a property that we're purchasing or have purchased. It's very generously licensed to us by pg e another great corporate partner. Uh, and uh, that's just one element of a wonderful process of cross-sector partnering we've been involved with and including recently a truly generous uh, grant from the John Muir Community Foundation, for which we're very grateful. They've just put $300,000 into this. We have $300,000 into it already, into the ground, and are in the process of hiring our first apprentice employees who will be out on the farm this fall. Here's a design of what that farm looks like, and uh, uh, we've been uh, out there turning earth and getting it ready to make sure that we reach our primary goals, which is to grow and distribute organic produce in this community-supported ag program, most especially to provide this safe and nurturing place. And some of you may know of this program already or not, but this is a program to provide transition-age foster youth or emancipated foster youth a place to, to work, participate in a healthy community to have a job. These are paid jobs for these apprentices so they can remain in the foster youth program as they build confidence and leadership skills and a work ethic that allows them to really move forward with their lives, having suffered oftentimes a great deal of trauma, no fault of their own, to, uh, to move forward in their life with uh, future education opportunities, uh, perhaps at Los Medanos right nearby or job opportunities. There's so many synergies to this, this program. And also we expect to be bringing in uh, local K through 12 school kids to have them working with these kids who are out there as apprentices on the farm, better understand the need for healthy and just food systems to really understand where does your food come from. And uh, here's just a quick list of the folks we've been partnering with uh, again, Thanks so much to John Muir Mount Diablo Community Health Fund. They've been so generous, so helpful. They helped us not just – it wasn't just writing a check. They've been such a great process in putting together a, a business plan and, and, and just all the things that we need to do to make sure this succeeds in perpetuity. pg e First Place for Youth, you see them all, Youth Homes, CASA, Contra Costa County, their independent living skills program through uh, family services. Los Madonos, we expect that's a great community partner for, uh, you know, uh, college education as these kids move on. Uh, food goes out to the Solano Food Bank as well as local restaurants and uh, the uh, school district. Uplift Family Services, Lutheran Social Services, Tender Greens as a restaurant tour that's been very supportive. Just a great, like I say, great uh, cross-sector uh, partnering project for the land trust as we expand our mission to provide that social service and just to, you know, just get get into some of that um, therapeutic horticultural work that really helps all of us with you know increasing self esteem and so forth. So we're really excited about that. And then painted rock. There's been a lot of questions about painted rock. Uh, trail buildings are going to be happening over the coming season. Anticipated opening date would be this fall or winter. Fall already accomplished a couple of controlled burns out there to bake for fire. We'll be working with uh, Moraga in the fire district to accomplish another this spring. Uh, we we are not involved with pyromania. We're we're really saying this is a, a wonderful way to steward this property. Um, it's it's ensconced right there in a in a suburban area, and uh, it's it's got a lot of buildup of brush, it hasn't been stewarded for ten years. So we're really moving forward with making that safe and accessible and healthy. We're also, and this has been a question, uh, we're also moving forward with helping to uh, encourage the 420 on acre adjacency here, these easements to become updated. Um, folks want to know when can we get out, not just on Painted Rock, but the whole 505, uh, which looks something like that here, which is as large as Lafayette Reservoir Rec Area, which 1.2 million visitors a year here. We expect there to be hundreds of thousands of people potentially that visit these trails. Uh, we're very excited about it. 
these trails are really uh, part of Hollis Colorados and Rancho Laguna too. We're encouraging those easements to move forward. The opening of those trails are more or less more or less parallel track to those easements being finally approved. Uh, so there's some regulatory agencies involved in that as well, but um, we will keep you abreast of that. And again, I keep using the word encourage because we do have some involvement with hopefully helping to make that happen as soon as possible and the whole thing would be open um, for this kind of experience. And I think it was uh, Emerson that said, every sunset brings promise of a new dawn. Well, here's a picture of that new dawn out on Painted Rock. Uh, it's a wintry morning last year. You can see the frost on the ground. Uh, acquired in 2019. Um, this is what it looks like as the sun comes up. A little bit greener as the day comes on. And as the day is long, it's just spectacular out there. A uh, gorgeous 500-acre, 505 eventually, with just wonderful water elements, uh, gorgeous habitat, uh, just wonderful trails, and including for this family of three with a dog um, up on the ridge. And I think we're going to do some, maybe some more Q&A and a poll here, Melanie. Yeah. Let me pull up my video again. Um, so we wanted to ask everyone, um, what their favorite recreational activities are on our properties. So I'm going to launch school. Um, and again, it's multiple choice. You can pick as many as you like, and I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds. And people are responding very quickly to this one. Good. I know we're coming in for uh, coming in on one o'clock here pretty soon. I'll try. We have a little bit more, but I hope you can hang with us because there's some other exciting things to to let folks know about as well. Yes, thank you for the time check. Um, there have been a lot of really great questions, so thank you, everybody, and we do promise to get back to everyone. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and share some results. Um, hiking is a real big one, as well as bird walking mm -hmm. and wildlife viewing. Fantastic. Well, this, this property in particular that we just showed is going to be one of the, I think, premier hiking spots in, in the entire East Bay. So, and all of these other elements will be possible out there as well. Yeah. So in the interest of time, I'm wondering if we should just move forward and then do a Q and A at the very end, Linus, would you like to do that? Yeah, I think so. Let's, let's okay. make sure, because uh, there's some slides here, I think, as I, as I recall, if I move to the next, we want to, speaking of hiking, we want to make sure that you know our properties are open from dawn to dusk, um, that you that you can safely access them as we're in this this time of you know elevated concern that there are still great nearby destinations for you to visit. Uh, we simply um, ask that you you know practice safe uh, distancing socially and so forth when you get there. In fact, let me let me do this very quickly so that you can see. If I go to uh, our website, there's plenty for you that you can instead of my walking you through it all you could go to jmlt.org and right here it says properties go here you'll see a list of all of our properties each one of them has information maps directions and so forth make sure that when you're finding the property you want to visit nearby you know you don't have to go regional you can go local there's plenty of nature right nearby for you to to visit when you do Read this as well, how to stay safe. We want you to be out there and enjoying some open space. These are the investments you've made. They're there for you to enjoy. Do it safely, in good health and well-being. But remember to review these practices. Um, I was talking to Jay Dean, our creative strategy director, the other day, and he was saying, yeah, I was way out on property, and I realized, oh, I was going to touch a gate latch, and I was miles from the nearest open water. Bring hand sanitizer. So review these elements because these details, you're not necessarily always aware of them, but at this time, if you just review this, you're going to be able to stay out on property in a healthy way, get out on property, I should say, in a healthy way, and stay connected with, uh, with one another in that way, but at a safe social distance. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that again. Pardon me. I'm get out of that. Come back to 
this. There it is. So, and again, here's some near dive destinations that we'd recommend that are open for you to enjoy. We also would invite you to great stuff here to join our virtual and independent activities. Hannah Hutchinson, our community programs manager, has been uh, really putting some great things together along with Krista Vosco, our director of philanthropy. Uh, Nature Gratitude Challenge, we're launching a peer-to-peer -peer campaign that begins on Earth Day, April 22nd. And uh, volunteers can get together and share their experiences, fundraise for the land trust, an opportunity to, to share your experience and garner support for the land trust work on, on a whole range of projects and, and uh, uh, things that you may enjoy being involved with, including Pacheco Marsh. And then we also have a virtual kids poultry slam. Um, you know, speaking of Emerson, let's, uh, you know, April is National Poultry Month. Let's keep it going into May. Uh, virtual poetry slam, same elements as a live poetry slam, but you don't have to leave your house uh, to participate. Provides an opportunity to uh, have some fun and gather in a compelling way virtually. And you check our website and social media platform forms to learn more about that. But we're really excited to have you sign up. You sign up and be part of our poetry slam. And uh, there's also the virtual botany hike. This is a wonderful event presented by uh, Contra, Costa, Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. I'm talking too fast, sorry. Carquinas Watershed Council and JMLT uh, will join California State botanist uh, Dr. Dean Kelch, who's a longtime uh, recognized expert out on Fernandez Ranch, helped us with the original restoration of Fernandez Ranch. And uh, he is going to go out and see what's blooming this spring on on Fernandez Ranch out on those beautiful oak spotted hills and record a virtual experience of that botany hike for you to enjoy to learn about local flora and uh, to, just to really see that up close with Dean but then having experienced that when you go out to Fernandez you can then have that very close-up experience yourself in ways that you probably, even if you were hiking with Dean, you couldn't get as close as he's going to be able to produce in that, that virtual botany hike. And then something else to enjoy would be our oak tree monitoring blitz. Uh, we've worked for years with UC Berkeley's uh, forest pathology and mycology lab uh, to map the distribution of sudden oak death. In the East Bay this year, we hope you'll join us to participate in that blitz out on JMLT properties. Uh, it's an online independent activity that can be done while respecting social distancing standards out in the field as well. There's also a whole bunch of other volunteer opportunities, um, including trail monitoring, photography, and more. Uh, visit jmlt.org to learn more about that and to RSVP for events and volunteer with the Land Trust. We'd love to have you be part of our team, of the team. Um, it's, uh, it's great having you with us today, and we'd love to see more of you ongoing. And uh, I think we've come to uh, uh, that Q&A that we were talking about before. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so Charles asked, is JMLT contemplating more acquisitions around Painted Rock? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, as you know, we work with Welling Cellars, and that tends to be a, a, a confidential process, which we, we hold confidential to protect the owner. Um, in other words, these are oftentimes family assets and so forth. We're careful to make sure that whoever's assets are being contemplated are, are well guarded um, on behalf of that willing seller. So there's a number of properties in the, uh, what we call our Moraga Hills campaign that are actually in contract and that we are working on quietly in the background. And then as we pointed, so those will proceed, they will eventually be permanently protected and some of the connections will uh, just boggle your mind. The way the, the, the whole region out there will connect up by trail and contiguous landmass is, is a beautiful jigsaw puzzle coming together. And as we contemplate, um, you know, 800,000 additional people coming to the East Bay who need places to recreate. Um, as we provide additional jobs and transportation and, 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 and all that's needed for that housing, 
that we will also be able to supply these trail connections and places to recreate in the midst of that growing, that growing East Bay. So we're happy about that. So the, the short answer is yes. Many of those are already in contracts. Some are certainly being negotiated. And then as we talked about, the 505 acres is also in process, and we are involved with trying to advance those conservation easements to a place where they can actually be opened up for the public to enjoy. Right. Okay, and one last question. Um, uh, Tom asks, will Almond Ranch or other new acquisitions provide access from Mount Wanda to Briones? Yes, great question. In fact, that was one of the key um, – these are all big great questions, by the way. But, um, yeah, that was one of the key elements of the acquisition of Almond Ranch is from the JMHS, or the John Muir National Historic Site, and Mount Wanda. You come up to the ridge, hike out to Almond Ranch, and then down toward Brionis along the Vaca Creek Trail take you – it's actually the only way across uh, the Alhambra Valley – safely to a then East Bay Regional Park District staging area, uh, virtually I'm indicating a staging area there, I'm gesticulating wildly in the background here, to then access more than 6,000 acres of Briones with our partners with East Bay Regional Park District. So yes, Almond connects to everything north, south, south, east, west. It is, it is such a keystone property that way. So. Uh, Yes, it does connect from Mount Wanda to Briones as well, including for equestrians coming from the other side. So it's just mountain bikes, the whole, the whole deal. Everybody is welcome on those trails and in the most uh, wonderfully recreational way. It's, it's going to be a great, great opening. Great. Well, thank you, Linus, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I know we ran a little bit over. Um, we really appreciate all of your questions and your answers to our polls. And um, uh, Linus, did you want to do sort of the, the final uh, end off with some? Yeah, and I hope you've heard me saying it all along: is that we so appreciate your support. So many people on the on the phone in the in the virtual presentation today are longtime supporters. Thank, thanks so much for being uh, part of our team, part of the Land Trust, supporting supporting that mission. And uh, remember to get outside and enjoy a nearby property. They're, they're there for you. The, those are investments you've made. They are available to you. Uh, it's great for your mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Get outside. And thanks again, and have a great rest of the day.